thank you very much, Carl. Hey, good morning. Welcome to Second Unitarian Church. I'm John Broom, a member of the church's board of trustees, and my pronouns are he and him. Today, we're meeting virtually using Zoom, so we ask everybody's indulgence. In Zoom, the chat feed is available to say hello and to share your joys and concerns at that time in the service. You can also use the Zoom closed captioning through the live transcript option. Now, when we sing together and read in unison, you're encouraged to do so even though you are masked or on mute. Our voices echo through the world, so we will hear one another if we listen closely and sing with our full spirits. Obviously, we're paying close attention to COVID recommendations, and that could mean changes at any time, but for now, we recognize maintaining physical distance is an act of love and protection. We especially welcome our newcomers this morning, and we're excited to have you and look forward to getting to know you. So if you're new to us today, you're welcome to note that in the Zoom chat. Our worship today is led by the Reverend Jason Leiden, our called minister. Sue Burke is our worship associate, music director Carl Kennedy, and the two-year choir provide our music. Also, our time together requires just a large number of people who make the worship and music and technical production possible. Thanks for the service. Their names are in the order of service. And I have a couple of announcements for you this morning. First of all, we postponed our celebration of Alicia Obando, our outgoing director of faith development, until we can meet in person and honor and celebrate her ministry together. I want to remind you that tomorrow evening at 6, we will have a town hall via Zoom providing an update on the capital campaign. Please tune in and learn. You can find more information and additional announcements in the order of service. Now I'd like to introduce Karen Goldner, who's going to talk about something really important to me, and that is our eighth principal product. Karen? Good morning. My name is Karen Goldner. My pronouns are he, she, hers. Um, I want to first of all say what the eighth principle is, and then I'm going to um, have some brief comments about it. Um, the eighth principle is proposed for the UUA, the Unitarian Universalist Association, to adopt. Uh, to add to what's currently the seven principles. Um, the eighth principle reads, we the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse multicultural beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. Over the Christmas and New Year's holidays, I read The Wake Up by Michelle Mijung Kim. She is a diversity, equity, inclusion professional, and the subtitle of the book is Closing the Gap Between Good Intentions and Real Change. I highly recommend it if you are looking for a very practical and accessible guide to anti-racism in the workplace or in, in organizations, particularly in the workplace. But there's no wine here this morning, so this isn't a book club. The reason I mentioned the wake up is that in thinking about what I was going to say this morning, I decided to quote from Kim's book. She's talking here about why we should commit to anti-racism, and here's what she says. The most sustaining why is one that directly involves ourselves. It is one rooted not in our desire to help others from a place of distance, but in our understanding that each of us, that we each play a crucial role in upholding and dismantling systemic oppressions that ultimately impact all of us. This is why, this why, I'm sorry, this why reveals that our ignorance and inaction do not make us neutral bystanders to systemic oppression. Instead, they make us complicit and also harm us in the long run. She continues. The deepest why comes from our intimate understanding of how all of our struggles are inextricably tied and how there can be no true liberation without all of us being active participants 
in dismantling all forms of oppression. Kim concludes, oppression harms everyone, albeit to different degrees, regardless of the role we play. Commit to realizing that systems of oppression that seemingly do not hurt us actually do, even when we benefit from them simultaneously. Reflecting on Kim's words has been helpful to me in putting language to the reason I support the eighth principle. I want my faith to raise anti-racism to the level of our other principles because the true liberation that Unitarian Universalism promises demands it. Let me conclude by repeating Kim's words. There can be no true liberation without all of us being active participants in dismantling all forms of oppression. Thank you. Burke to lead our call to worship. We are a Unitarian Universalist congregation, a community of children, youth, and adults, a people of many beliefs and traditions bound not by the specific things we believe, but by the values we share. Whether you are joining us for the first time or the thousandth time, you are welcome here. Whatever your race, whomever you love, whichever way you move in the world, however much money is in your pocket, whatever is in your Zoom background, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God some of the time, all of the time, or none of the time, you are welcome here. I invite you, as you feel ready, to take a breath in and out. As the music begins, let us enter into our worship together. Thank you, Carl. In just a moment, Daniel Wammeldorf over Zoom and I here in the sanctuary 
We'll light our chalices, the symbol of our faith. We light our chalices this morning with these words from Amy Lloyd. Today, I want to greet joy without a trace of suspicion. I want to open my eyes to the light without a blink of dread. I want to look at my past without a whisper of shame. I want to look at my future without a hint of fear. Today, I want to dance without pausing to think. I want to belly laugh without caring who hears. I want to open my arms and twirl in the sun until I fall breathless, free to be myself, full of the joy that I open to allow completely letting go without even a smudge of suspicion or a wink of hesitation. That's my intention. It's what I want. Daniel, would you join me in lighting our chalices, please? Please join me in singing our opening hymn, hymn number 159, This Is My Song. The words will be printed on your screen. Please join me in reciting our covenant. The words will be on your screen. Or maybe not. Oh, here they are. We covenant to build a community that challenges us to grow and empowers us to honor the truth within ourselves. We will be generous with our gifts and honest in our communication, holding faithful to a love that embraces both diversity and conflict. Called by our living tradition, we will nurture spirituality within a vision of the eternal, living out our inner convictions through struggles for justice and acts of compassion. 
please join Carl in singing our congregational hymn, Spirit of Life. This is a time for all ages, so if your younger folks who share space with you aren't with you at this moment, you might want to encourage them to join you for just a little bit of time. Uh, and for everybody else, I encourage you to participate as well and see what of the story might resonate to you. I have a few helpers to tell my story today. I have Zebra number one. Oh, you can see their face better this way. Zebra number two, right here. And a kangaroo. Traditionally, these creatures don't necessarily share the same lands, but for today's story, they're going to be sharing the same space together. So in this story, we have our two zebra friends who are off running about, doing zebra things. Wait, what might a zebra thing be? Maybe galloping? They're kind of like horses, but not quite. I like to imagine they might be galloping around together, doing some galloping as zebras, or possibly swimming together over here in their little swimming area, doing zebra things as they do. And their friend the kangaroo says, well, what about what about me? I want to come and play as well and do these things with you. And they said, sure, of course, you can come. Why not? You can join. As we run, you run. As we swim, you swim. But Kangaroo said, well, I don't run, really. I, I hop. I, I'm much better at hopping than I am at running. And I don't really swim. And I don't know much about kangaroos, but I've decided today, this morning, that the kangaroos don't do a whole lot of swimming, especially not with zebras. The zebras are doing swimming much better and in a much stronger and deeper way than the kangaroo can do. And so the kangaroo is beginning to feel kind of left out. Zebras are doing zebra things, creating a little zebra life of fun and saying, sure, kangaroo, you can come along, but not making space not doing things kangaroos can do, not doing things that both zebras and kangaroos can do. And so one thing we're talking about this morning is what our intentions end up doing. When these zebras say, sure, you can come and hang out with us, they're having good intentions saying, yes, kangaroo friend, you can join us for our fun zebra time. And there's only good thoughts there of, please, yes, join us. Good intentions. But the kangaroo, unfortunately, can't do those things. It's excluded anyway, even though the zebras might have good intentions. I'm wondering if you've ever done something like that. I know I have. I think all of us have, where we think, oh, I'm being inclusive. I'm bringing my friends along, but oh, my friend can't or doesn't want to or is unable to do this thing with me. And so they feel the impact is they feel excluded, even though I intend to include them. So our good intentions 
while important, it is very important for us to hold good intentions. Absolutely, our hearts want to be filled with love and care and compassion and friendliness as we are interacting with other people. But good intentions aren't necessarily quite enough. We have to take another step, figure out, well, what does it mean to include my kangaroo friend if I'm a zebra? What does kangaroo want to do that I can do, that we could do together? That more than just me saying, you're welcome to do what I do, figure out what we can do. What is it that meets all of our needs, that makes everybody feel included and part of the game? I wonder if you've maybe played games that your friends don't like, so you play a game that you know you both like. Maybe somebody likes Legos and somebody likes tabletop games, somebody likes video games, and you're figuring out all together, which games are we gonna play when we're in this space? How are we going to be with each other and be well and caring with each other and not only intend to be caring and welcoming, not only intend to do good, but to take the actions, do the steps, things we need to do so that the good feelings, those good feelings can happen and they can be felt by everybody. So that's what we're gonna be talking about during the service today is good intentions and the impact good intentions have. And so thank you for listening to my story about zebras and kangaroos who in this land hang out together, even if sometimes they don't hang out as well as they probably should. And that is the time, <clears throat> excuse me, that is the close of our time for all ages. Uh, the, I will keep my little friends right here for now. Uh, and thank you all so very much. Each year, we all make a commitment, a pledge to support the ministry of this church. In addition to this contribution, each Sunday we take a collection so that we can share with those doing justice work well beyond our walls. While we are unable to come together in person right now, we can still share our resources. And in a moment, you'll see a phone number on your screen and you can follow some text prompts to make your contribution this morning. For the month of January, we are sharing our plate with the Midwest Access Coalition. We heard a little bit about their essential work last week and we get to hear more about it this week. This morning, we'll hear some words from Nicole Lopez. Nicole. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nicole Lopez, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a board member of Midwest Access Coalition. Thank you so much for having me and for supporting MAC this month. I know that Madison told y'all a bit about what MAC does last week, and I'm excited to dive a bit deeper. So MAC focuses on what we call practical support, meaning that we support folks with the logistics and incidental costs related to abortion care. Because we know that laws restricting abortion mean that people have to travel farther, take longer off of work, work secure childcare, spend more money on gas or on planes, hotels, food while traveling, so on and so forth. MAC focuses on tearing down those financial and logistical barriers to abortion care. This means that our client coordinators are often problem solving and reacting on the fly to whatever barriers are specific to each client. Um, our director of client coordination, Marie Kahn, is going to talk about those barriers a bit more in depth next week um, from her experience working directly with clients. But today I'm excited to share a bit about my experience as somebody at MAC who's a bit more behind the scenes. The role that I serve in MAC's operations focuses more on the technology side and that technology that allows us to respond to our clients and partner with them in problem solving. And so each, in each year of our, of our existence, MAC has doubled the amount of people who we support, which has been such an honor, but has also come with some problems of scale because we have to have technology in place to allow our largely volunteer team to support folks on the fly like this. So I'm excited to share with you a few of our kind of big wins. Um, over the past two years, Mac has migrated to a bona fide client database from a spreadsheet, as well as to a real hotline 
from a shared free Google Voice account. Like we really, we really made that Google Voice account last. Um, and that has allowed us to better meet the needs of our clients and to allow volunteer coordinators greater ease in collaborating to support those clients. We've also launched a custom app that has allowed us to get cash in the hands of clients in a way that does not impose another barrier. One thing that is really um, like an interesting problem that we have encountered and a terrible problem that we have encountered is that many of our clients are either underbanked or you know, might have an abusive partner or an abusive um, family member who's surveilling their bank account. And that's made it very difficult to provide direct financial support via PayPal or Venmo, something like that, that's made it a lot more difficult to provide support in that manner. Um, and so our app has allowed us to meet people where they are and get cash directly in their hands. Um, and we are currently actually striving to expand that app um, in partnership with ReproCare, which is another abortion fund um, that focuses on removing barriers to telehealth abortion care. And our goal is to allow other orgs to benefit from the technology that we have been able to allow our clients to benefit from. And we are really seeking to share back basically any and all of our tech solutions that we find that work for us with other organizations in the, in the abortion space. That way we can all like aggressively care for one another in the face of forces that are prioritizing punishment and coercion over care and autonomy. So thank you so much for your support as we continue to like build these systems of care so that we can love one another better. Thank you. Um, now, I invite you, now I invite you to join me in, in reading our offertory words. The words are printed in your order of service and are on the screen. This church is the community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. As we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm it and enable its participation in the larger world around us. The offering will now be generously given and gratefully received. I invite you now to join me in the spirit of prayer or meditation. Let us begin by breathing together. I invite you to relax the muscles in your shoulders. Relax the muscles in your neck. 
Allow any tension in your jaw to release. And take some deep breaths. We begin in thanks. Thankful for the breath in our lungs, the strength of this community, and the beauty of this earth. We hold in our hearts those who care for family and ill health, those who live with grief or chronic pain, those struggling with addiction or illness, seen and unseen. We are with you. For parents and teachers and all those whose primary spiritual practice is the care for children, we are with you. We pray for our neighbors in prison, for those who are struggling to stay afloat in the midst of poverty, we are with you. We pray for all those living in harm's way, we pray for our planet and commit to work that will lead us away from the harms of climate chaos. We pray that wisdom, compassion, and empathy guide the leaders of our world. May they and we be instruments of a just and lasting peace. Our lives are truly blessed by those who knowingly, with curiosity and courage, face their final days. For those locked in concentration camps still at the border, held in cages and inhumane conditions, for those in ICE, <clears throat> excuse me, detention centers right here in the city of Chicago, we are with you and commit to doing more. For those struggling with fear and anxiety right now, we offer our prayers of comfort and care. For those sleeping in tents throughout the city right now on these cold, cold nights, we offer love and solidarity. For those struggling with the impact of isolation, we promise to reach out with care. Into this, our shared silence across space, I invite you now to speak the name of anyone you wish to lift up into the loving support of this, our community. With our deepest compassion, let us hold in our hearts those named and unnamed, those remembered, and those forgotten. Let it be so. Amen. And blessed be. In just a moment, I will light two candles, one representing those joys and celebrations that we are experiencing right now, and one in honor of those sorrows and struggles that we are also going through. As the music continues, I invite you to share your joys, celebrations, concerns, and sorrows in our chat window.
I cannot get enough organ. Thank you, Carl. We hold all of these joys, celebrations, concerns, and sorrows close to our hearts. Sue, would you share our first reading, please? Our first reading comes from Unitarian Universalist minister, Reverend David Miller, and it's an excerpt from his sermon, Intent versus Impact, Resolutions for a New Year. When I first came to Unitarian Universalism, I heard the phrase, assume good intentions. Assuming good intentions was something that I hadn't thought much about through my life. I guess I went through the early part of my life having grown up in the political shadow of Chicago and having been around as a youngster in the 60s and 70s, I didn't always assume good intentions. You know, don't trust anyone over 30, they used to say. So I didn't always assume good intentions, but I have always hoped for the best. At this stage in life, I do try to assume good intentions. I have seen and included that in many covenants through the years. Covenants made in groups, congregational covenants, and various agreements between people. I think the meaning of assuming good intentions is that we shouldn't immediately assume that people are angling for something, or they're trying to manipulate us, or that they have some sort of hidden agenda. Assuming good intentions is living with the belief that some people are inherently good, that people are inherently good, all of them. And although we are promise makers and promise breakers, we are a promise renewing people. This was all well and good until I also, through being a Unitarian Universalist, learned from doing anti-racism, anti-oppression, and multicultural work that we can walk around with the best of intentions, but if we are not mindful, aware, and take responsibility for the impact of our actions, words, or behaviors, we can have the best intentions in the world, but having good intentions doesn't really make the grade. Thank you, Sue. Our second reading this morning is a poem by Jacqueline Allen Trimble. It should be read in a more spoken word way than I really have the skills for, so I encourage you to find the recording online and listen to it how it really should be shared. It also has a couple of words in it that I thought might not be super helpful for some of our ears on Sunday morning, so there are a couple of little edits as well, but I appreciate it very much, and I hope you do too. This carpet-bagging, gentrifying Aryan mother's son cut through our neighborhood buying houses, called himself a community developer, clipped all the edges in liberty neat and bound for himself and his posterity, declaration of independence just doing what it do, and he was pursuing that happiness all right as if it were being stolen or massa they is a running down the street kind of way with him after in full stride. Boy, could he smile, unhinge that jaw, clip it to his ears, wide and sparkly and toothy as an old toothpaste commercial to buy and sell all abandoned buildings and occupied ones too. Some folks who knew better could not fly fast enough to miss the buzzsaw of his charm or his sign on the dotted line readiness that left them standing outside their generational house admiring a stranger's yard, boxes stacked on the sidewalk. And then he painted his own house, alt-white and even black neighbors followed suit, mouthing something about clear, pure lines and look as if good intentions could emerge from a paint can. We all know there is fur beneath the closest of shaves. Wolf comes uninvited as five o'clock shadow and even lamb sacrificing both wool and meat for somebody's, <clears throat> excuse me, pretty cuddle 
have eyes to see the coming nick and slaughter. At least, I know very well, I do. Let's hear our anthem, please. Thank you, choir. Nice to see you singing and performing and creating together. And thank you, Carl, for making that happen. The way we speak with one another is constantly changing and is shaped by so many different relationships. The way one speaks to their mom is likely very different from the way they speak with their best friend. The way one speaks to a teacher is likely not the same as the way one speaks to a barista. And yet some things in language and conversation last for generations and keep showing up across relationships. We have these common sayings, idioms, proverbs that become so commonly known, we do not necessarily even say the whole thing, but still know what each other mean. For instance, the saying, she who laughs last, laughs best, is almost never said in its entirety. The same is true for when in Rome, do as Romans do. These proverbs become a rooted aspect of language, shaping and informing how we communicate with one another and how we build understanding. The title of my sermon this morning will likely lead you to quickly begin pondering the proverb it is referencing. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. We reflected last week on intentions for 2022, and we will reflect more on the beauty of intentions this month as the Soul Matters theme has us ponder what it means to be a people living with intention. Today, though, let us think about the shadow side of intentions, the question of intentions relationship to impact. 
This proverb itself dates back centuries, possibly millennia, depending on what language one looks in. While hell is referenced right in the saying, there are more secular origin stories to this saying than there are religious ones. The one etymologist highlights a possible connection to a hadith from the prophet Muhammad, and there's a theologian who highlights similarities to a saying found in one of the wisdom books of the second century. So it's really not possible to attribute this saying to one person, one place, or one community, or certainly one time. This impossibility highlights the similarities of human experience. We know we are different, and we talk about how different we are a lot, and we'll talk about how different we are probably today. And yet we are connected to something larger than ourselves, part of a legacy of human experience and possibly spiritual experience that crosses time, space. We run up against the same questions over and over again because some of the answers cannot be found with the scientific method or even with the wisdom teachings of our ancestors. Some questions and dilemmas are constant and we get to learn from generation after generation how we might answer or struggle a bit differently even if we don't reach a final answer. And so we reflect on this saying today, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So let's ask together, what does that mean? Is it true? Have I paved a road like this? Have I experienced the hell referenced here? But aren't good intentions good? I'm sure there are other questions you might come up with. Let's see what we can reflect on together. I do want to take a moment to acknowledge right away the use of the word hell. I preached about Unitarian Universalist theological perspectives on hell last year, and we will certainly reflect on that more because, alas, there is much to be said about hell. The simplified version for today, though, is a reminder that as you use, we do not fear a hell after death. We do not need to worry about eternal suffering and punishment because that is outside of our theology. We may not all agree about what happens after death, but the common thread in our theologies is that it is good. Instead of a place of suffering after death, it is common for you, you clergy, to say that all we need to know of hell, we can learn right here on earth. There is enough suffering and pain right here that the universe or God or complex physics is not planning a transition of our spirits or minds to even more suffering after we get through this life. We can understand the hell in this saying to be a place of suffering, injustice, brokenness, oppression, pain, loss. You may have other words you would use to describe this hell, and maybe the words change depending on which hell the road may be going towards. So now that we've shared a reminder about what hell means, what are good intentions? How do you know if you hold good intentions? Who gets to decide if something was done with good intentions? Do the zebras get to just because they said it was good intentions? Is that good enough? Or in the story that Sue did for us today, we heard Reverend David share about his experience of hearing you use covenant with one another to assume good intentions. As we heard in that reading, assuming good intentions is living with the belief that people are inherently good, and although we promise makers and, <clears throat> and although we are promise makers and promise breakers, we're also a promise renewing people. 
So if we are assuming good intentions and we are believing that people are inherently good, why? Why do good intentions lead towards hell? Poet Adrian Rich offers this. I can't write a poem to manipulate you. It will not succeed. Perhaps you have read such poems and decided you don't care for poetry. Something turned you away. I can't write a poem from dishonest motives. It will betray its shoddy province. Like an ill-made tool, a scissors, a drill, it will not serve its purpose. It will come apart in your hands at the point of stress. I can't write a poem simply from good intentions, wanting to set things right, make it all better. The energy will leak out of it. It will end by meaning less than the words that it says. A poem that comes simply from good intentions will have less power than the words it uses, which includes something about good intentions involved in this poem, not simply good intentions. So maybe the problem is not with the good intentions, it's the lack of other pieces. Both Adrian Rich's poem and Reverend David's sermon's excerpt made me think that we could avoid the road to hell if good intentions were maybe an ingredient in a larger recipe. For I know that if I made dinner and I forgot garlic, I'm pretty sure I'd be destined for hell. And that's what happens when you don't include all the ingredients. So I want you to think of a time when your good intentions brought you and maybe someone else closer towards hell rather than the green pastures you had intended. We've all done this. And part of how I know we've all done this is because we've been asking this same question for, like I said, a millennia. So we have all done this. So rather than feel shame, as you take a moment to think of this time that you cooked without all the ingredients, maybe instead of shame, take a moment to just be reflective. Ponder what you learned. Maybe imagine how things could have been different not judging yourself. Take that moment. For me, I know there are many. And there's one that I'll share with you now. When I was still living in Boston and working for Black and Pink, an LGBTQ HIV prison abolition organization, one of the things I did was accompany people to court when they were facing charges. As part of the court support program, we would text people reminders, ensure they had a way to get to court, remind them when court was happening, remind them their lawyer's information, sometimes their lawyer's names, and discuss what other support they might need. Many court-involved people would also provide court support to one another. This was really a mutual aid effort. On one of the days that I was supporting someone, I noticed a person in court who I read as queer. We were constantly doing outreach, so I had information that I wanted to give the person so that they might be able to access community, get connected to our resources, and just to black and pink in general. And so during a break in court, I went up to the person who was with a couple of other older people, and I introduced myself, black and pink, and tried to give some outreach material. The person looked horrified. And they said that they did not need anything from me and turned away immediately. I was a little confused, but met back up with the person that I was supporting. There was another couple of hours of court and I found myself in the hallway during another break and that person I had gone up to came over to me, this time just by themselves. They were very upset and they said, I'm not out, 
to my parents, and I cannot believe you did that to me. You need to be more careful. I was mortified. I started to apologize, but they were already gone. My good intentions had created a hell for this person. Regardless of whether I actually outed this person or not, my good intentions were not enough. And yet, to be honest, I still don't have an answer for you today what the better thing, the right thing, would have been to do in that moment. I still am not really sure. We can have good intentions, do the best that we can, and still cause pain. It can be somewhat easier to look at good intentions on a structural level, a little less personalized for us. It can be easier to see the institutional failings. In Esquire magazine in 1960, James Baldwin wrote this. All along the streets are people who watched me grow up, people who grew up with me, people I watched grow up, along with my brothers and sisters, and sometimes in my arms, sometimes underfoot, sometimes at my shoulders, or on it, their children, a riot, a forest of children, who included my nieces and nephews. When we reached the end of this long block we walked, we'd find ourselves on wide, filthy, hostile Fifth Avenue, facing that project which hangs over the avenue like a monument to the folly and cowardice of good intentions. How much of public housing, not only in New York City, but right here in Chicago and all across our nation, has been done with good intentions, but with racist, classist, and violent ramifications. Right now, our city is struggling with figuring out how to educate our young people. Our partner organization, One North Side, put out a statement that I'll share a few lines from. The failure of CPS to reach an agreement on safety resources and protocols and its failure to plan adequately for the current surge has increased risks for all of its staff and families but especially for those communities with the least access to health and safety resources like vaccinations and testing. This means their fight is everyone's fight. There's a longer letter that you can hopefully access if you get their emails. The city may have good intentions, but hell is being created for many as young people remain out of school, as tests are scarce, as PPE is missing, as plans are not made for how to address these alarming rates of COVID. In her book, All About Love, the late, great Bell Hooks wrote, we are all vulnerable. We've all been tempted. Even those of us committed to an ethic of love are sometimes tempted by greedy desires. These are dangerous times. It is not just the corrupt who fall away to greed. Individuals with good intentions and kind hearts can be swept away by unprecedented access to power and privilege. We are all vulnerable. We all fall short. We are a promise-making, promise-breaking, promise-renewing people. Sometimes we pave roads to hell with good intentions. Sometimes others pave the roads and we end up in that hell. Our responsibility is to keep trying. Keep rising up, keep healing, keep struggling for accountability, keep changing, keep growing, and keep attending to our shared faith. We do not do this alone. Let it be so, and amen. Please join me in singing our closing hymn, number 131, Love Will Guide Us. The words are on your screen. Love will 
will guide us Peace has tried us Hope inside us We'll lead the way On the road from Greed to giving Love will guide us Through the hard night If you cannot Sing like angels If you cannot Speak before thousands You can give from Deep within you You can change the world With your love Oh love will guide us Peace has tried us Hope inside us Will lead the way On the road from Love will guide us through the hard night. Love will guide us through the hard night. I invite you to Rest your hands upon your heart or clasp hands with those you are sharing space with at this time. And hear these words of benediction from Eric Walker Wilstrom. If you are who you were, and if the person next to you is who they were, if none of us has changed since the day we came here, we have failed. The purpose of this community, of any church, temple, zendo, mosque, is to help its people grow. We do this through encounters with the unknown, in ourselves, in one another, in the other, whoever that might be for us, however hard that might be. Because these encounters have many gifts to offer. So may you go forth from here this morning, not who you were, but who you could be. So may we all go in peace, my friends.